Good morning, and welcome to Men of the Word, the ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland in Peach County, Georgia, just a few miles east of the city of Fort Valley. My name is Greg Cannington, and today I'm filling in for Pastor Jerry Axtell, who normally does these lessons. But before we open, I'd like to open this study with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your infinite blessings and your manifold grace. Lord, we ask that you bless this time together in your word and that you will send your Holy Spirit among us. Open our hearts and fill us with your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I hope and pray that everyone had a wonderful and uh, holy time of Thanksgiving this past week with your friends and your family. I'd like to remind all believers that every day that the Lord gives us should be a day of thanksgiving. Rather than focus on the problems or the pandemic we're currently under or any other troubles of our times, let us all resolve to focus our thoughts on the infinite love and grace of God Almighty and His free gift of forgiveness and everlasting life through a relationship with His Son our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will tell you that I can highly recommend something that my wife and I periodically do, that before we go to sleep, before we say our prayers, quite frequently we try to take some time and start listing all of our blessings. And husbands, I promise you, your wife will remind you of some that you don't remember. Nevertheless, it's a good thing to do and say them out loud together. I promise you that you'll find this list of blessings is almost virtually endless. And as I learned as a young child attending Sunday school, one of my first memory verses was Psalm 100. And the psalmist wrote this some 3,000 years ago. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. He, it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures for all generations. That's why I say it's important. God's Word tells us we're invited to this personal relationship with the Creator, the Almighty, in an intimate way that he has given us. And with praise and thanksgiving, we find our troubles tend to fade and in his glory in comparison. And our hearts are filled with joy. And all of us can have that. So it's a good thing to do is periodically, not just on Thanksgiving Day, but every day to reflect on the things that the Lord God has done for us. <clears throat> Last week, uh, Pastor Jerry closed out our study of the prophet Haggai. In last week's lesson, we saw in the last two verses, the last few verses of the last chapter, chapter 2, prophecy of Haggai promising a signet or sign of authority to Zerubbabel, who was the acting governor, but was also from the Davidic line of King David. This uh, prophecy promised this signet, which was the seal on a ring normally, pressed in wax, which is the authority of the king. So what the prophecy tells us is that Zerubbabel and his line will be given the kingdom, the authority through the signet, that the coming Messiah was coming. Well, today, this first day of December, and as we enter this Christmas season, where we celebrate the birth of our God and Savior, it's a perfect time to begin the study in this next book, the book of Zechariah. 
And as an, it is our custom in Mendel, where we always begin a new book with an overview of the book and some of the historic and some of the critical highlights in God's work. It's interesting to note, especially this time of year, the book of Zechariah contains the clearest and largest number of messianic passages amongst all the minor prophets, second only to the prophet Isaiah, which is a major prophet or the long, a very long book. Zechariah's name in Hebrew means the Lord remembers. And when in, you look in your Bible, Lord is capitalized, which signifies it's the covenant name of God in the old Hebrew scriptures. And we, we know from Nehemiah chapter 12, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Zechariah was a priest of the priestly line. Zechariah was born in, in Babylon during the captivity. And Zechariah joined his grandfather, Edo, who was also a priest, and a group of 50,000 Jewish exiles that returned to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel, son of Shittiel, the governor of Judah. And Jehos Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now you'll see these names mentioned again uh, a number of times in, in uh, Zechariah, and the reason is that the, the two prophets were contemporaries, Haggai being the elder. According to Jewish tradition, Zechariah was a member of the great synagogue a council of 120 originated by Nehemiah and presided over by Ezra, and this council later became known as the Sanhedrin, which we see uh, frequently in the New Testament. As I said, Zechariah was a younger contemporary of Haggai, and many of their prophecies are similar. He began his prophetic ministry two months after Haggai in the second year of King Darius, about 520 B.C. He came along, along the older side, the older prophet, to deliver messages from the Lord to the Jewish remnant, recently returned from Babylon. And chapters 1 through 8 generally take place at the same time as Haggai's beginning in October, November, 520 B.C., with a call to people to repent. But in the overall scheme of things, the book of Zechariah contains eight visions that occurred in one night in February of 519 B.C. And we know these dates can be pretty precise because he gives us the Hebrew calendar date and the year, month and the day in relationship to the, the reign of the king. So these can be pinned down exactly. Even though we have different calendars, we can actually tell exactly when. Following these eight visions, there's also four messages that he preached. And uh, in the final chapters, chapters 9 through 14, although they don't have a date in relationship to the king, he does mention Greeks, the Greeks suggesting the prophecy came later in his life, sometime before Ezra and Nehemiah arrived in uh, Jerusalem which would be about 444 B.C. Now, as we mentioned, the book of Zechariah contains more references and more messianic prophecies than any other minor prophet, second only to Isaiah. This is why it's so important for us to see this and, to, and it's very clear. When, when we say there's more of them, they're also very clear and very precise. There's no doubt what it's referring to. It can only be Jesus. For example, he describes in great detail Christ's first coming and the triumphal entry in Jerusalem that we know it as Palm Sunday. He describes Christ's betrayal for 30 pieces of silver and to include what happened, what the silver was used to purchase the potter's field. His prophecy also includes images of the crucifixion, crucifixion, the uh, 
the type of wounds given to our Lord. He also contains Jesus' second coming. And this is, all, this is something that uh, a lot of people don't really notice. And as we get through this study, you'll see this. He describes how Jesus will come first as a savior, then as a judge, and ultimately the righteous king ruling on his throne from Jerusalem. These eight visions, four messages, and two oracles are not exactly in order, but they're all there. Zechariah uh, anticipates completion of the temple and ultimately Jesus is the Messiah's reign in, from Jerusalem. For the people newly returned, and there was remember there was only about 50,000 in this first group, Zechariah's Specific prophecies about their both immediate and their distant future gave them great hope and promise. Their nation would still be judged for sin, as we see in chapter 5, but they would be cleansed and restored. God would not only when they have his temple rebuilt, he would rebuild his people and the people that followed him. As I mentioned, the conclusion of the book looking into the, the distant future. He, Zechariah also describes in chapter 9 the rejection of the Messiah by Israel and then their eventual uh, belief when he comes to live and reign as king. Friends, if you're not already a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, these prophecies should gladden your heart, should give you chills as it does me, to know that the Almighty God, creator of this universe, wanted to know to all those who trust him that he has everything all planned out. He already knows the beginning from the end. He tells us in his word from beginning to end things that are going to happen, things that have happened, and why we should live under his love. He's in control. And if you're a believer, you're a child of the king. And if you're a child of the king, are you not under his tender, loving care? Of course you are. Stay the course, I encourage you. Trust in Jesus and stand up for what is right and according to God's word and in his sight. Not what man says, but what God has said. He's not changed. Mankind is fickle. Rules come, rules go, but God's word is forever and it's eternal. And all the time that you do this, do it with praise and thanksgiving for who he is and what he has done for us. Always, always, Lord, keep your eyes upon Jesus. However, if you've not yet confessed the Lord Jesus as your Savior, please don't let no, another day go. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's not hard if your heart's right. The Holy Spirit will move you. And all it requires is a simple prayer, something like this. It's got to be from your heart. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I believe you are the Son of God sent by the Father to this world to provide a ransom for us sinners from a debt no one but Jesus could pay. Jesus, I know you led a sinless life on this earth, and your sacrifice on that cross paid for sin of all humanity. He rose from the dead. He defeated death forever for those who have faith in you. Dear Lord, come to live in our hearts and be the Lord of my life. Lead me in all your ways and fill me with the Holy Spirit so I will be your servant all the days of my life until the time you come and gather me to yourself forever. Amen. If you prayed a prayer like that, welcome to the kingdom of God. 
I find it very comforting to know that in Jesus said in chapter 5 of Luke, verse 10, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God as one sinner repents. Next week, we will begin in earnest our study of the book of Zechariah. And uh, we'll stumble through the, the names again and probably mispronounce them. But I want to leave you with a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 9, recalling that it was written 2,500 years ago, a full 500 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And they are, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. God bless.